In this video, I'm going to go through the OCR A-level chemistry paper. This is the uh, paper three from 2020. Uh, this paper three is the kind of synoptic paper, with everything on it. Okay, I'll do this in this paper in two halves. I'll do the first half in this video and the next half in the next one. Okay, the first question then is about practical uh, techniques of an organic preparation. Complete the missing labels and name the technique. Well, of course, it is reflux, is the name of the tech heating with reflux. Um, complete the missing label. Right, so we have got um, pear shaped flask there. Uh, this thing is the condenser. And I think it wants to label here that the water should go in there, should the water go in at the bottom, and the water, the cooling water, should come out of the top bit. Okay. And of course, it should be the water in at the bottom so that the water fills up the entire jacket like that and doesn't just trickle down. Okay. Right, <clears throat> next draw a label diagram to show apparatus setup for filtration under re reduced pressure. Okay, so we're going to need a um, Buckner funnel. It's got a sidearm there. Um, and here you have a bung. It's important that. Uh, and then the, the funnel sits in the bung. It's important that the funnel goes through the bung. If it doesn't do that, they will not they will knock marks off. Okay, so uh, this this goes to the vacuum. This is called the Buckner front Buckner uh, flask. This is called the Buckner funnel. my bung like that and that's the button front and then on top of the, that you should have a piece of filter paper the red thing there okay so i think it's important that you that when you're drawing that that's you know the flask is sealed at the top and that the you know it's going through the bung um it's not you haven't got it <clears throat> just like a solid bung there which they would definitely not marks off for that. Okay. About amines now. Okay. The structures and boiling points of three amines, structuralize them as okay. And you can see they've got quite different boiling points. Explain the difference in the boiling points of the amines. Right. So what we need to say is that uh, this is the first amine. And the second amine, so one and two, there's a possibility of H bonding in those between molecules, okay? And H bonding is the strongest intermolecular force, so that explains their relatively high um, boiling points, right? If you look at number three, H bonding is not possible because you don't have a hydrogen attached to the nitrogen. You need the hydrogen attached to the nitrogen to make it delta positive for hydrogen bonding. So you don't get any H bonding. So the only kind of intermolecular forces you are gonna get there are um, you will get um, some permanent dipole-dipole. Dipole interactions because of the, that molecule will be polar because you've got a lone pair on the nitrogen there. It's not symmetrical. The nitrogen is more electronegative than the, the carbon to which is attached. Um, and you'll also get some um, uh, London forces as well. Okay, now they are a lot weaker than hydrogen bonds. So that's why the boiling point of that one is, is way lower. Right, to get all of our marks, we now need to explain why one has got a slightly higher boiling point than two, right? Now, the reason for the reason why one is slightly higher is because uh, it is not branched. So it's gonna have a uh, larger surface area. Uh, 
So uh, it's possible to have um, uh, more points of contact. I'm going to get the dog out. Sorry about that. More points of contact, larger surface area, so stronger London forces. So the boiling point is slightly higher than in this one here, which is branched. So the surface area of the molecule is slightly less. And so um, uh, the, the London forces are a bit weaker. Okay, right. Carrying on with amines, you have this amine A. And we need to work out the, um, the molar mass, the MR of this amine using the ideal gas equation. So, okay, and then they give us a little bit of information about its 13C uh, NMR spectrum. We have to suggest possible structures. Okay, so let's work out the MR of this first. Now we're gonna use PV is equal to NRT. And we're gonna use that, rearrange that to get the number of moles we've got. So that's gonna be PV over RT. And now we've got the number of moles. We know that the, because um, uh, moles is equal to mass over MR, okay, different color. We know that the MR is gonna be equal to the mass divided by the number of moles N, which of course we're gonna work out from the ideal gas equation. Now when using the ideal gas equation, you've gotta be really careful to use the correct unit. Uh, centimeters cubed that needs to be converted into meters cubed so we divide by a million so that's going to be 72 times 10 to the minus six meters cubed uh pascals is okay uh, we don't they haven't given us in kilopascals and pascals we can just use that straight off uh, and then we need to convert our temperature 100 degrees c into kelvins so that's add 273 so that's 373 kelvins okay let's put the numbers in there then so you get N, number of moles, uh, one times 10 to the five, multiplied by the volume, 72 times 10 to the minus six, divided by the gas constant, which is 8.31, multiplied by the temperature, which is 373. And that works out to be 2.32 times 10 to the minus three. Three moles. Right, we're now ready to put that into this equation here. So the MR of our gas, or of our substance, uh, the mass where we put 0 0.2202 grams in there, divided by the uh, MR, sorry, by the number of moles, sorry, gives us 87 point one. So that's the MR. Okay, now we have to um, try and suggest a stru structure for the amine A. Right, so, well, first of all, I'm going to try and estimate the number of carbon atoms in there. Okay, so I'm going to say, right, we have 87 MR is 87. Let's take away 14 for nitrogen. It's got one nitrogen in there, it's an amine. That gets it down to 73. Now let's divide that by the atomic mass of carbon, 12, to see how many, so to see how many carbons we could have in there. So 73 divided by 12, that is equal to uh, just over six. Right, now that's not accounting for the fact there's gotta be some hydrogens in there. So it can't really be six carbons. I'm guessing it's gonna be five. Let's see how that works out. So if we have five carbons, it's going to be C5. Well, just imagine if it was a straight chain, which it isn't, it couldn't be this, we'll talk about that in a minute, but that would be C5H. There'd be 11 hydrogens there. It's a primary, and then you have it in the NH2 group there. <coughs> well, um, you can see there that that 
uh, that all adds up to 87. So I think that's what we, we've got. The, the formula is going to be C, there's five carbons. There are 11 hydrogens and there is one nitrogen. That's what we've got. Okay. It tells us we have only got uh, three peaks in the 13C spectra. Now, if, if, if it was the thing I'd drawn there, each one of those carbons is, is different to the other. So that would give you five peaks. So that's not gonna work. So I think there's a few different things here, but that I'm thinking it's probably going to be a tertiary amine. Uh, and the first thing that springs to my mind was, was this one. Um, so I've put an, the nitrogen there, and if I put two, put two ethyl groups on it, Um, and a methyl group there. So that's the right formula. Uh, and we can see that uh, these two carbons are the same as each other. That'll give you one signal. These two are the same. Is that in yellow? That's the same as that one there. And then finally, we've got that one there, which is different. So that would give us three peaks. Now, there are a few other possibilities there as well. There's quite a lot of possibilities. I won't go through them all. If you want to look at the mark scheme, but that, that's the one that um, seem to spring to my mind, first of all. Okay, all right, next question then. All right, um, the amino acid with the formula below can react to form a cyclic compound with a molecular formula C3H3NO, okay, and one other product, all right? So we can see um, the number of carb carbons hasn't changed, so it just react reacted with itself. And what must have happened is we've got a carboxylic acid group there is going to react with an amine. You're going to get um, it's going to form an amide, a secondary amide. Okay, so if I just draw that, so okay, what's going to happen there is it, right, we've got NH. Um, we've got C, OH there, and double bond there. We're going to, and uh, it's a condensation reaction. We're going to lose that water molecule there. We're going to lose that. That's okay. We're going to lose that, and we're going to form a bond between those, the carbon and the nitrogen. So we're going to form that rather strange looking thing, okay, with a four membered ring. Uh, so that goes in that part of the equation there, and we get H2O as well so the condensation reaction okay six mark question about transition metal ions what is meant by the terms ligand coordination number and ligand substitution uh, use the names of suitable complex ions with different shapes and limit itself to monodentate ligands uh, include diagrams and equations where appropriate right so i thought and I checked with the mark scheme afterwards, and this seems to be you know, an answer. This is, this is kind of quite obvious what they want you to write here. Okay, so first of all, we've got to define what a ligand is. So um, it's a species, forms with a lone pair, forms a dative bond to the central metal ion. Probably worth putting it has got a lone pair there, even though I haven't written it down. Um, coordination number. Well, that's the number of dative bonds that the central metal ion is forming. We'll give examples of these later. And uh, ligand substitution, uh, again, best, probably best example given with an example. This, this ligand substitution is obviously when you swap the ligands. And we'll give an example reaction to illustrate that. Okay, so I think um, uh, the first complex ion I'm going to go is, is one of the, the hex aqua ones, okay, which has got six water ligands and is an octahedral shape like most of them are. I'm going to choose copper, copper two plus. So uh, here is an example of um, uh, copper two plus. We've got two plus there. And let's draw the 3D structure. So 
We're going to have four water ligands in. So those oxygens are forming dated bonds. The lone pair on the oxygen is forming dated bond. Well, there's two lone pairs. One of the lone is forming a dated bond to the central copper. Uh, so we've got four water ligands there, and then we've got one above the plane and one below the plane. Uh, that should go to the to the oxygen, that bond really there, shouldn't it? H2O. Right, uh, and name the shape, describe the shape of this one. It's octahedral. I may want to say all the bond angles are 90 degrees. Okay. Um, let's talk about another shape of ligand. Well, an, a, another shape of complex, we could have a tetrahedral one. And a good example of that is when we have copper with, um, with um, chloride ions. And the chloride ions are too big to form, to, form to, to get six around. So you only get four around it. So you get a tetrahedral shape. Of course, all those chlorides have all got a negative charge on them. So that's tetrahedral. And we can use that to uh, illustrate a, um, a ligand exchange reaction. So if I'm going to start a ligand exchange reaction, we can have our copper uh, hexaqua. Uh, um, and then we're going to add uh, a high concentration of chloride ions, usually conch HCl, you need to get the concentration high enough. Uh, and you're going to need four of those. And you will replace all of the water ligands with chloride ions. So the charge on, on the um, complex is now two minus. You've got two plus on the copper and four minuses on the chloride. And we're going to get six water molecules coming off as well. Okay, so that's a ligand exchange reaction. Um, I would probably also mention uh, the other shape which you come across, which is square planar complexes. Um, and square planar complex, a good example of that would be cisplatin. So you have a platinum with a two plus on it. Uh, and you've got uh, two chloride ion ligands. They're on the same side because it's cisplatin. And then you've got ammonia ligands here. Uh, that square planar is not tetrahedral. Uh, I thought maybe also mention the fact you can have linear complexes with silver. Um, so AG just has two ligands. Uh, I looked at the mark scheme, it didn't actually seem that you needed that, but there it is anyway. So if you got all of that down, I'm pretty sure you would get um, six marks for that. Right, okay, this is a about, uh, enthalp determining enthalp uh, delta H and so forth. Right, so you've got propane, gonna heat up some water in a beaker there, and the student plans to determine the ent enthalpy change of combustion uh, by two different methods, okay? Right, so here, right, what this, this here, they're gonna use this, right, let's see what the question says first. There's the results of it and determine the enthalpy change of combustion. Right, we're going to use two equations here. The two equations we need to use are, of course, we need um, Q is equal to MC delta T, where uh, Q is the quantity of heat release, M is the mass of the water heated up, C is the specific heat capacity of water, that's the temperature change, and then we need to convert that delta H is going to be equal of combustion, is going to be equal to the quantity of heat release over the moles of propanone burnt, okay? So we're gonna to have to do uh, put that into, into there. Let's see how we're gonna do that then. Right. Um, right, let's do the, uh, work out those masses. So from, we're gonna work out the mass of propanone burnt uh, is going to be, we've got propanone burnt, we're gonna subtract those two, one from the other. And if you do that, you get 0.242 grams propanone. 
the mass of the burner before and mass afterwards. Uh, here, this is going to give us the temperature change delta T, subtract 21.6 and 46.1, you get the temperature change of 24.5 degrees C, delta T. Right, using that information now, let's put that into, oh, should we work out the moles of propanone first? Yeah, let's do that. So the moles of propanone. is equal to the mass over the MR. The mass burned was 0.242 grams, and the MR propanone is 44. Uh, so that gives us 5.5 times 10 to the minus three moles. Okay, now we are ready to work out uh, Q, okay? So, Q, the quantity of heat released, well, that's equal to the mass of the water in the, in the current, not the mass of the propanone, it's the sort of the classic mistake people make. It's the mass of water in there because it's going to heat up that much water. That's 100, that's 100 grams of water. The specific heat capacity of water is on your data sheet. That's 4.18 joules per mole. Uh, important to remember it's joules actually joules per gram sorry per kelvin because we're probably going to convert to kilojoules afterwards and delta t is 24.5 that gives us a value of in q of 10,241 uh, joules now we need to put it into the second equation here to work out the heat of combustion so delta h combustion is equal to q which is 10241 divided by the moles of propanone, which we worked out was 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus three. That gives us a value of uh, 186200. Okay, that's joules divided by a thousand. We get uh, 186 kilojoules. But it, we're only given all our, oh, we, the least accurate bit of data, I suppose, or the given to is to oh, calculate your answer to three significant figures. It does say that's to four. So I need to change that. And very importantly, I need to remember it's exothermic. So it's a minus, the heat was, was released, eight, six, zero kilojoules. And if you forget that minus sign, after all that work for three marks, you lose a whole mark for not putting that in. So don't forget that. Okay, and now the classic question next is coming up. They always ask this, don't they? Okay, the student finds the experimental value is much less, right, much less exothermic, okay, than the, than the accurate value in the database. One reason could be not carried out standard conditions, okay, but what are the other two more obvious reasons for this difference in entropy change? Well, the first one, of course, is not all the heat is transferred to the water. Some of it goes into the air, a lot of it goes into the air. To the water. And the second one I would say is you could get incomplete combustion. They're the two sort of answers that you can always give. And they always ask that question, of course. Okay, now in the next part of this question, they're gonna do it. Um, using bond enthalpies and they don't need to do an experiment. Okay. Right. The bond enthalpies can be used to determine the enthalpy change of this reaction. And then if you look at this bit here, they give you this value here, right? This isn't really standard. This is not Delta HC because the water produced there is water in the gaseous form and it should be in the liquid form for the standard, uh, the standard one. And of course, when water gas turns into water liquid, you get heat released, okay? It's exothermic. So um, we have to sort of add that on at the end afterwards using this delta H VAP thing, which I'll come to in a minute. But first of all, let's just work out, using bond enthalpies, let's work out the value delta H for this reaction, okay? Which is pretty straightforward as long as you don't, um, uh, if you're not careless, you have to be careful, okay? So we've got 
are pro is right, it's sometimes worthwhile just actually drawing what they look like okay rather than writing c3h8 just remind yourself the right number of bombs and so on so there's propanone and we're going to add five oxygens does it say i think to balance it yeah uh 502s yeah and they're a double bond between the two oxygens uh and that is going to give us um what, three carbon dioxides so we're forming like six of those carbon oxygen double bonds and four waters so we're forming eight oh bonds right what i like to do is to do an energy cycle i'm going to break all those bonds there and breaking bonds, of course, is endothermic. So this, this is going to have a positive value. So we're going to break uh, two carbon-carbon bonds. It's very easy to think it's three there, but it's not. It's only two, of course. So it's two times three, four, seven for them. We're going to break eight carbon-hydrogen bonds. They are four, one, three. And we're going to break five oxygen-oxygen double bonds, and they are four, nine, eight. Right, if you add all that lot up together, you get 6,488. So here I'm going to write down gaseous atoms. Monoatomic atoms, yeah. And then we're going to build it all back up again. It's green arrow. This is making bonds, so this is going to be exothermic. So we're going to give those a negative value. So it's going to be... Six times minus 805 for that's for the carbon for these carbon oxygen double bonds, and then it's going to be eight times minus uh 464 for these oxygen hydrogens. At all that lot, you get minus 8542. So now let's work out delta H using Hess's law. So delta H, the yellow, is going to be equal to plus 6488 minus 8542, that works out to be 2,054 kilojoules per mole, 54 kilojoules, okay? Minus 2,054 kilojoules. Now we need to think about this water, okay? Because what we need to do now is we need to convert uh, four moles of water, gaseous, to four moles of water, liquid. Now it tells us that delta H VAP, the vaporization of water, right, <clears throat> go in the opposite direction, direction it's plus 40.65 it's plus 40.65 so going this way it must be it's endos exothermic it's minus 40.65 but we're going to multiply that by four that is equal to 162.6 so finally our delta h running out of colors here delta h combustion in standard conditions that's going to be equal to minus 2054 from the what we worked out for the equation and then minus sorry that should be a minus there as well and then minus a bit more for the water we get for the the energy we get out when the water vapor turns into water liquid okay and that gives us a value of minus 2216.6 kilojoules per mole Okay. Right. Now, this is a, a student carries out an investigation to identify M and X by two, two metals, by two different methods. Right. Now, the first one, this identifying M is the more tricky one, I think. And the issue is a back titration. Okay. So I've drawn a series of little diagrams what's going to happen here. Okay. So if you read the question, it says, uh, right, you get 6.9 grams of the metal M here. All right. Well, by the way, we know the mole. This is the, the we start off with moles of HCl. And I've, I've written it down as HCl initial. That stands for 
the starting moles of HCl. Right, how are we going to work? Let's work that out while we're here. So we have got 0.1, that's the volume, multiplied by 2.1, that's the concentration. Okay, so the concentration, the moles, HCl I, times volume, uh, 0.1 times 2.1, that's equal to 0 0.210 moles. Okay, we're going to use that later on. That's HCl initial. Now then we're going to put in some metal M, and that's going to react with some of that hydrochloric acid. So in the beaker, it's going to be after the M metal has all dissolved here, we've got HCl final, which is going to be less moles than the initial. And the, the, aim, the aim of this is to find out how many moles have been used up by subtracting final from initial, and then we can work out the moles of M. That's the whole thrust forward of this question, okay? So anyway, we've got our moles of HCl final, and then that's diluted up to 250. Okay, and so you still got the, that's the final number of moles in there. That's the same, nothing's happened there. But how much of that do we take out? We only take 25, you take a tenth out, okay? And we find out how many moles of HCl are in that by titrating against NaOH. And NaOH and HCl react in a one-to-one -one ratio. So we work out the moles of NaOH. We can work out the moles of HCl in there. We can then multiply by that by 10 to give us the moles of HCl in, in the 250 and, and progress from there. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. All right, I am I'm going to sort of um, skip a few questions out and answer them at the end as it seems to make more sense to do it in this order. Okay, let's do, let's do the titration calculation. All right, so they give us the titration results. Uh, initial final reading, initial reading. Okay, we... Um, Subtract so them, and we only take our concordant titers, and you can see that that's so within point 0.1 of each other. This one here is not within point 0.1 of the other ones, so we ignore that. So the average titer is 27.25 centimeters cubed. That's the average of the other two, on our concordant. Right, so then we know the, the moles of our NaOH there. It's 20, sorry, we know the volume, 27. Okay, so let's do that. Moles of NaOH in the titration. Concentration times volume. 0.32 multiplied by 27.25 over 1,000 to put into decimeters cubed. That gives us the number of moles of NaOH, which is 8.72 times 10 to the minus 3. Now, the equation, we know that one mole of NaOH reacts with one mole of HCl. So we can say the moles of HCl uh, in 25 is going to be the same. That's in 25. So therefore, we can say in 250, You multiply this by 10, so that's equal to 0 0.0872 moles. Now we've worked out the final moles. That's what HCl final is. It's 0 0.0872, okay? All right, I'm gonna just skip that bit of calculate, that bit of question there and just come down here. So I'm gonna write down moles used up. Moles HCl used up is equal to HCl initial minus HCl final. The initial moles was, we've got it here, 0 0.21 minus the final moles, we've got that there, 0 0.0872. Uh, so that gives us a final, uh, that gives us um, 0.1228 moles have been used up.
Now, now we can come to answer this little bit of question here, right? So it tells us here that metal and HCl, they react in the following way. The, the metal goes to the plus two oxidation state. So if I have to write an equation for that, then I'm gonna have M plus HCl. Now the metal's in the plus two oxidation state, plus two ion, that means it's gonna be MCl2, isn't it? Because the chloride ion is one minus an H2. So to balance that, I need to put a two there. So M and HCl react in a one to two ratio. So what I can do in the next step here is to say, therefore the moles of, um, of M is equal to half the moles of HCl because they react in a one to two ratio, which gives us 0 0.064, put up 614. Okay. Now we know the moles of M and we know the mass of M. We can work out the atomic mass of M because we know by right, right down here, uh, atomic relative atomic mass, AR, is equal to the mass divided by the moles. Sorry, is equal to mass divided by the moles. So that's going to be in the, the mass of the metal they told us in the question was it was um, 6.9 grams. And that was that number of moles of the metal. So you work that out, that gives us 112.4. Now, if you look in your periodic table, the metal which is closest to that is cadmium. So our answer, the metal is cadmium. Right, so that was the calculation which you get like six marks for. I'll just do the other little bits and pieces now, okay? So um, this one here, right, it is a redox equation. The oxidation, the, the M is oxidized to two plus oxidation state, isn't it? So M goes to M two plus, and you get two electrons, obviously. It's oxidized. And what's reduced? Well, the hydrogen ions are reduced. They go from being H plus, plus one oxidation state, to H2, so that's zero. So we're going to need two electrons there. The hydrogen is reduced. Okay. And then there's other little bits and pieces which they've asked down here, I think. Okay, suggest in stage one, when you put the metal into the acid, suggest two observations that will suggest that all of the M has reacted. Well, when the M, so first of all, the M would dissolve, the metal would dissolve. You couldn't see, you shouldn't be able to see any metal there anymore. Also, when you put it in there, it makes hydrogen gas, it's fizzing. So when the reaction stopped, the fizzing should have stopped. They're the two obvious observations there. They aren't really any other ones. Right, an ionic equation taking place during the titration. Well, if you remember, the titration was NaOH plus HCl. So if you turn that into an ionic equation, you get Na plus and OH minus. The Na plus is a spectator ion. HCl is H plus and Cl minus. The Cl minus is a spectator ion. So, and so it's just a matter of the H plus and the OH minus forming water. Okay, right, let's do this last bit, about halfway through the paper. Right, a different way of finding X here, you get a metal carbonate X2CO3, and you're gonna react that to make with acid to make carbon dioxide, okay? Now, when you make the carbon dioxide, that's gonna leave the flask, so you can, the mass of the flask will drop. So you can find out the mass of CO2, from that, you can find out the moles of CO2. From that, you can work out the moles of that. One mole of CO2 comes from one mole of X2CO3. And then we're going to do the usual thing to find out the MR of X2CO3. Uh, is going to be equal to the mass, which we can, we can work out, uh, divided by the moles, which we just said how we're going to do that. Okay. So let's do that. It does actually give us a bit of a clue. It tells us to work at the moles of CO2, first of all. Um, first of all, I'm going to do, I'm going to write down, what is the mass of X2CO3 used? Well, that is going to be this minus that number there, isn't it? Yeah. So and you do that, you get a value of...
14.57 grams, okay? So we've taken away the 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 mass of the of of the flask and HCl plus from the mass of that with the with the carbonate before the reaction started. Right now, if we look at these two, um, the 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 drop in mass from those two is caused by CO two leaving the flask. So I'm going to write down here the moles of CO two subtract one from the other. Sorry, the mass of CO two. Uh, subtract 184 from the 187 one, and you get there a mass of 2.75 grams of CO2. Right, wants us to work out the moles here. So how would you do they divide by the MR of CO2? Moles is equal to the mass over the MR. 2.75 over 44, which gives us 0.0625. Okay, so now we have got the mass of the carbonate and we've got the moles of, well, let's just state here, that's the moles of CO2. Because they react, because one mole of that gives you one mole of CO2, we can state, and we should write it down. So the moles of X2CO3 is also equal to 0 0.0625. Now we're going to put that number there. We know the moles of the carbonate and we know the mass of the carbonate that there. We're going to put it into here to work out the MR of the carbonate. So let's do that. MR is equal to mass over moles. The mass is point, sorry, 2.75. divided by 0 0.0625 and that gives us an MR of 233. Okay, so we've worked out the M molar mass of the this one. Now we need to work out what the metal X is. Well, the CO2 bit of that weighs 60. So the what does the, the, the two times X weigh? That has a mass of 233 minus 60, which is equal to 173. Now to find out what one what x weighs, you need to divide that by two. So x is equal to 173 over two. That is equal to 86.5. Okay, and if you're checking your periodic table, the AR with the closest value to that, and it would form a one plus ion, it would be rubidium. Okay, so that takes us, oh, no, it doesn't, because we've got a few little questions to ask about the procedure, answer about the procedure. We've worked out the identity of the metal, um, but it says here, uh, after analyzing the student told their molar mass was incorrect. Um, uh, the student evaluate the experiment for possible reasons for the incorrect result. When the weather reaction was complete, when the mass was recorded in step five. So you put the acid on and the mass goes down, CO2 is released. How can you tell if it is, um, how can you modify it? Well, rather than just doing it after five minutes, you should do it after five minutes. And then after like six minutes or a few minutes later, you should reweigh. Now, if the mass has gone down more, it's, it, it will tell you the reaction is still happening. It's still making CO2, so you should reweigh again. If it hasn't gone down anymore, that tells you that it's not making any CO2. It's stopped and it is complete. So we should reweigh re until you get constant mass, which is a fairly standard thing to do. All right, the next question is a little bit harder than that one. Okay, it says the student finds out the carbon dioxide is slightly soluble in water. So that means not all of the carbon dioxide is going to leave the flask. Okay, so we've got to say what would that do to our calculated value of the molar mass of that? Well, what we did, we said that the molar mass MR is equal to the mass of carbonate divided by the moles of carbonate. 
Right, now if the carbon dioxide is soluble, that value there underlined in red, we are going to underestimate that. In other words, that is going to be, we're going to measure it as being smaller than it really is. Okay, now if that number is smaller than it really is, and then dividing by it, it's going to make MR bigger than it really is. Okay, so the calculated value of, B of MR will be bigger than the correct value. So that, that question was a bit harder, and that was two marks. Okay, that is about halfway, so I'm going to stop the video there and carry on in the next one.